forever. Dog. I used to think that this was my town. What a stupid thing to think. I hear you biting off a brain now. I myself am on the brain. I used to want to be a real man. What's up, freebies? What's up, diamond dogs? What's up, diamond cats? What's up, diamond hamsters? What's up, diamond ferrets? What's up, diamond snakes? What's up, diamond hermit crabs? What's up, diamond cows? What's up, diamond pigs? Just trying to get some variation in there. What's up? It's your host, Rhea Butcher, back for another episode. Almost took a week off, and then I was like, nah, I've got the time. I can do it. I'm flying to Dublin. I've never been there. Pretty excited about it. I'm watching baseball right now, and Mikhail Franco almost got hit in the head, so I stopped talking for a second. Um, I'm excited to go to Dublin. I'm going to be at the Vodafone Festival. If you're in Ireland, you should come to that. Uh, My first show is going to be what I think will be tomorrow. Um, So check that out. All those dates and info are on my website, is on my website. Sometimes I'm not great at grammar. Glad to be back. Um, Shout out to my bass buddy, Paul F. Tompkins, for such a great uh, tweet about the episode last week. I really appreciate it. Um, It was a tough one to get into because I just had a lot of stuff happening for me in my life. You can probably relate, but I'm back on track and excited to talk about the stuff that happened in baseball. (sighs) Where do we start? Um, Number one, just want to give a shout out uh, because I am watching baseball right now. I'm watching the Dodgers at Phillies. Tender matchup for me because Phillies have become one of my uh, personal favorites to watch and grow. Also... I said, did I not say, watch out for these guys, watch out for the Phillies, don't underestimate them, they have all the pieces, guess what, they're in first place. Don't know how long it's going to last, and I think Philly fans are pretty upfront about the fact that they don't know either. And uh, Stripling just gave up a home run, so there you go, who knows. But the thing I really loved was... uh, I really did love seeing Chase Utley's at bat. I just, these are the moments that make me really love baseball. I think uh, recently I've been focusing on the things that make me feel outside of baseball. And I'm going to get into one more of those things after this in a moment. But for now, I just want to talk about, and look, Chase Utley is a divisive figure in baseball. I understand that. Um, If you're a Mets fan, yeah, you hate that guy. He broke somebody's leg. And you're going to think that I'm a hypocrite for saying anything even remotely close to this, which is, uh, I mean, he broke somebody's leg doing something on the field. Now, I'm not defending it, and I'm not saying, hey, what happens, it happens. I mean, they had to implement a rule to stop it from happening, which means it wasn't illegal when he did it. Am I saying it was great? Absolutely not. But I also understand how sports are played, (laughs) uh, mostly because I've played them over the course of my entire life on an organized team, on an unorganized, uh, you know, uh, uh, independent situation. And yeah, you want to win a game, you throw some elbows, you run wide, you you do things. Those Those are the things that happen. And some players are known for being enforcers. He's an enforcer. That's the kind of game he plays. Um, honestly, if you're going to have terrible things happen, I'd much rather them happen on the field while these guys are playing rather than them doing a bunch of terrible shit in their personal lives. I I know that sounds hypocritical, but good Lord. Again, I'm not saying break people's legs. This isn't what the point of the sport, but, um, when you employ, well, formerly employed two domestic abusers on your roster and rarely talk about that. Um, I don't know that you really get to say this guy's a piece of trash um, because he did a wipeout slide. So anyway, that's just how I feel about it. Chase Utley, with the exception of those wide slides like that, look, man, he is a journeyman baseball player. 
Uh, there's a lot of dudes like that. Rajay Davis comes to mind. It, it comes to my mind. Um, you know, you get in there, you hit the ball where it needs to go for the moment that you're playing. <laughs> you know, he's not up there tra- cranking home runs. He's up there to put the ball where it needs to go. Um, and I respect that. I love that type of player. I don't value that type of player over other types of players. I just think that type of player deserves the respect, uh, uh, the same as a home run hitter or a 101 mile an hour flamethrower. Um, and Chase Utley is one of those guys. You put him in, he hits the ball, he runs, he catches the ball, he plays the game. So that's what I like about him. And I definitely had tears in my eyes just now when uh, Philly played his walk-up song. That doesn't happen. You don't play a, a visitor's walk-up song. I just think, uh, you know, the the respect that transcends a player leaving a team, um, it speaks volumes to to a player. And I also have to say, I really love how much Kike Hernandez loves him. If you're not already following Kike Hernandez on social media, number one, I can't believe it because of the stories I told of him last week. So do yourself a favor. Follow him on, at least on Instagram, because he does stories. And his stories with Chase Utley are very cute. I mean, it's just straight up cute. It's cute and fun. And it makes me feel good about baseball. And it makes me feel good about these dudes that play baseball. And it's a, a, a wonderful counterbalance to all the garbage that we put up with in professional sports. So I highly recommend that. Um, now, to get into, like I said, the negative things... Um, uh, in last Saturday's home game versus the Dodgers, an overwhelmingly, almost exclusively white Milwaukee crowd gave Josh Hader a standing ovation in his first pitching appearance since the All-Star game. During the All-Star game, it was revealed that Hader had made a series of racist, homophobic, and threatening tweets years earlier. Because the standing ovation occurred before Hader threw a single pitch, it was unequivocally in reference to the offensive tweets. And bench coach Brett wanted to add into this. Just FYI, as I write this, I have pardon the interruption on in the background, and there is an actual discussion going on about the intentions of the crowd. Tony Kornheiser, terming his approach the high road, is arguing that he, because he doesn't know the hearts of the fans, he is willing to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that they are cheering haters' apology and not haters' tweets. Michael Wilbon is having none of that and says it's a clear example of the trumping of America. I mean, I would argue that this has always been there. However, the trumping of America would be dirt- turning up the dial. He follows that up with a great line. Charlottesville was a year ago. I'm not, t- I'm not about taking the high road on this because I know for a fact that not everybody is on the high road. I could not agree more. Um, I think that it's who cheers an apology. I, I don't know. That's <laughs> it's, it's a real weird. I mean, look, look, look. I I think I said this last week, but the things that that guy said, if you if if you are a look, I I also know like he's tweeting stuff out. Was he getting in somebody's face and doing this? No. Are, are these slightly different? Do, do do I think that he needs to be fired and never never throw a baseball again? No. But I also think that there's a discussion to be had around these things, a real one that he could have, and. I don't know, perhaps make a PSA about it or something. I mean, I was watching uh, uh, ESPN Sunday Night Baseball last night, and the game was postponed, so there was no game, but they were running packages that they made. There was a package about this little girl who happened to be a little white girl who was being bullied in her school, and all the work that uh, the Yankees did to reach out to, 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 like, made her signs and, and all these things. Like, y- you know, the MLB knows is reaching out when it's not involving the MLB, which is the most telling part of it to me that like when, when it is a, I mean, that is a a bullying tweet. Yes. It just went out into nowhere and it wasn't directed at anybody, a, a, a specific human being, but it was directed at groups of human beings and the sort of ironic and or detached racism. And in this case, I personally believe Josh Hader's tweets to be the sort of detached yet definitely attached uh, white supremacist hetero patriarchy kind of statements. Um, it, it, those are not worse, but they're not better. You know what I mean? I I, nef- I I hesitate to ever say like, oh, well, that's worse. Because 
Racism is racism is racism is racism. It's all bad. It's all bad. It's almost like when I was quitting smoking cigarettes, something in the book uh, that I used to quit was saying that it's actually harder to quit social smoking, which is what I was doing, which is like, you know, a handful of cigarettes a week um, or even maybe one or two as opposed to a pack a day smoker. Because when you are on this cycle of nicotine addiction where you have a cigarette on Monday and you think, oh, that was fun. And then you go, I'm not going to, I don't need to, that was fun. I liked it. The third, fourth day rolls around and you're like, that'd be fun to do again. And then you just are on the edge of this cycle of this thing. And so I bring that up because that's the kind of racism and homophobia um, and bigotry that was present in Josh Hader's tweets. And that's what we should be talking about. Not, oh, poor guy. He was just a kid. He didn't know what he was doing. He doesn't know now. This is unfair. It's not okay. Blah, blah, blah. Like, shut the hell up. First of all, it's mostly white people saying stuff like that. And I know for damn sure that you at least for the one for one moment in your life have experienced this and you either partook in it or you ignored and went a, went along with it and you didn't call the person the people you were surrounded by on it i i know for a fact every white person that is out there that is saying this like i don't know what's in, in these guys hearts and oh we got to do this every single person is doing their part to sweep white supremacy under the rug and say, no, 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 it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Why? <laughs> Why? Because it would affect you if you had to admit that it exists. And what if we just admit it that, admitted that it exists? Because it does. It's very easy to see if you open your eyes to it. And it's not that hard to work against it. You just have to do it. It involves work and you just have to do it. But it is so entrenched and so ingrained that when anything even remotely comes close to scratching at the surface and saying, hey, I don't think this is okay. And this wasn't good. I mean, I saw the looks on uh, the players' faces when they were looking at that phone. It's disappointing, at the very least. It sucks to find out that your colleague is an asshole, and especially when they're an asshole to you. And yeah, you can say, oh, he didn't mean them. Yeah, maybe he didn't mean them, but it includes them. So he should have to do something more than, oh, I'm sorry. I mean, come on. Say I'm sorry one time. Suffer no consequences. He'll probably spend a day playing video games when he's getting his sensitivity training. And then he goes right back to work and gets a standing ovation from uh, tens of thousands of people, a majority white people. So tell me that's not white supremacy. Tell me where it isn't. And please stop trotting out uh, players of color to come to this guy's defense. It's offensive to them because they have to talk about it. You're not talking to him. You're not talking to white players to make them do it. Why don't you talk to white players about uh, the <laughs> constant thread of these kinds of things, this kind of bullshit and language. Can you even imagine how many players of color had to put up with hearing this stuff from players' mouths their entire careers? Read Jackie Robinson's autobiography. That's what he went through. Josh Hader's tweets were happening to him from not only the crowd, but his colleagues and the guys he was playing against. So I think you owe it to his legacy. If you're going to keep putting his number on everything. If you're going to keep bringing his family out in April and you're going to keep saying, we remember, then you should remember. And you should do something about it. Because Jackie Robinson would not be proud of the standing ovation that Josh Hader received on Saturday afternoon. So, <laughs> moving on. To a lighter topic, the militarization of pro sports. Uh, there was an article on WBUR over the weekend that I tweeted out for everybody uh, to uh, read. And again, you don't have to read it to listen to it, but uh, I think that it's a, a tremendous piece and it puts 
It's written by Howard Bryant, who uh, H. Bryant, 24, I believe. It's either 24 or 42. Sometimes I have a little uh, image reversal when it comes to numbers and stuff. Um, I highly recommend following that person on Twitter. Um, and it's just a it's a it's a wonderful piece about a lot of things that I've been thinking about a lot lately. And um, it essentially tackles the idea of like post 9/11 militarization of pro sports, specifically baseball. And we have flyovers, we have fighter jets, we have giant flags. Um, and these are just for games, just games, you know? I, I And something that's missing from a lot of this is like, uh, I don't know, respect of actual service and the actual service people. Uh, it talks a lot about merchandising, um, how these teams are tweeting out how fire camo jerseys are. These are words, a quote directly from the article. And I, I, I got to say, e- even if I just keep it specifically to the Memorial Day festivities, I have to say as someone uh, who uh, lost uh, a great uncle, and I know that sounds like so distant, but I was raised by my grandmother. It was her brother. She never got over it. It was her only brother. Um, his picture hung in my dining room. I saw his face every day. He's someone I didn't meet. He was not able to have kids because he was killed in action. He's buried in Manila. His body was not returned. That's what Memorial Day is about. It's not about camo jerseys and saying how f- how cool they are and fresh. And this is all... I- I'm saying all of this while being someone who has never been (laughs) pro-war i mean i was raised by uh uh uh, an anti-war like democrat voting wage worker um i not i am not somebody that is like rah rah we got to go to war blah 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 i'm not but i also understand that people enter the military that's a reality of of life and some of those people do not return from that service so the Memorial Day stuff in baseball, I mean, this year I almost couldn't watch because it just feels, it's so intense and it's people putting on these outfits and play acting this idea and uh, it's, there's also recruitment on field and it's just, it's not, um, yeah, one of his, uh, quotes was the MLB all-star game in Washington DC this week was so awash in ceremony. It conjured thoughts of an old joke with a new twist. I went to a military parade and a baseball game broke out. That's how it feels. I mean, I, it's hard to watch. Um, it's, it's honestly hard to watch, but I highly recommend reading that piece. I feel like the militarization of pro sports has bled into the militarization of our society. And, uh, I said today that it feels like that is something that has allowed gun violence to, uh, become so commonplace that somehow someone being shot, uh, in civilian life is just the price of freedom as though we're all walking around at war every moment. I mean, the country is continuously at war. Um, And so, yes, it is American imperialism coming home to roost. But at the same time, is that what we've wanted? That that we are in in a constant state of battle? And that any moment you could lose your life to the cost of freedom? The freedom of walking around? It has not been the case. I I, I also say this as a white person with uh, the privilege of that who is not all of a sudden realizing, oh, this is bad. Um, The price of freedom dying on the street um, has been different depending on the color of your skin, depending on how much money you make, depending on uh, your gender, depending on how you present your gender. It's, it's, It's been dependent. Your freedom has been dependent on an axis of all of those things. So I'm not, um, I apologize if I have waded into, this is very, very political conversation, but man, this is, I mean, baseball is very political and anybody who thinks it isn't 
isn't watching baseball. Um, so <laughs> I, I hesitate, I hesitate to go down those paths. I, it's hard to, it's hard to watch it gr- gain momentum and so much steam because I feel two ways about it. And those two ways are very complicated. So moving on to something a little more positive, some other things that maybe aren't quite so negative. Um, we've got uh, some good news out of Canada. Clara Cleese. Now, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. I apologize. I watched some clips and I never heard any pronou- anybody pronounce her last name. So I apologize. Clara Eccles or Claire Eccles, I'm not sure, is getting her jersey retired by uh, the Victoria Harbor Cats. She was a relief pitcher for them and one of the first women to in Canada to uh, play college baseball. She even had a bobblehead up there. There's going to be a great piece in our footnotes. She's somebody I've been following for a while. I mean, look, I just... Canada's got its problems, for sure. Um, I don't claim to know the specifics of them, and I don't claim to know all the details. But it does seem that Canada, for the most part, in terms of fan bases, seems to be a bit more progressive in terms of who can play a game. Canada loves baseball. Yes, baseball is very American. But I feel like because Canada is Canada, and Canada loves baseball, not because it's American, but because they love the sport, they aren't necessarily replicating the most American parts of it, which is exclusion. So, shout out to the Victoria Harbor Cats and give Claire a look. And this article that we're posting is really wonderful with some really great pieces and the fact that she got some girls to sign up for baseball. And speaking of which, I almost forgot to mention the fact that Uh, The first weekend of August, I will be in Rockford, Illinois for the Baseball for All Nationals. Now, Baseball for All, you may remember, I've mentioned it a lot of times, um, and I've also had its founder on this very podcast. That founder is Justine Siegel. She has put together uh, a national tournament that she does every year. I believe this is the third year, third or fourth year. And she's grown it from something of 20 girls to 300. So I'm going to be there for the closing ceremonies. I'm going to make people laugh for about 7 to 10 minutes. And then we're going to do a fun q and I'm really excited to meet everybody, meet all the teams, meet all the players, meet everybody out there. I'm excited to be back in Rockford, Illinois. And I can't wait to experience some baseball that's going to make me feel really, really good. So if you're in the surrounding area, if you're in Chicago... Why don't you drive? It's only like an hour to Rockford. I think you can take a train and come out and support this wonderful organization, this wonderful baseball organization, and this wonderful person, Justine Siegel, and these wonderful kids playing the sport that they love as and playing their hearts out. Please come out and give it a chance. That's something else that I truly believe in. We need to start supporting these smaller community grassroots kinds of kinds of kinds of activities that's something we're missing these days so come on out for that so now dodgers after the machado trade what do i think what are my initial impressions that's what bench coach brett wants to know my initial impressions are first of all just want to say some people responded to uh, my thoughts about the machado trade conversation during the all-star game Um, And brought up some great points, most of which was Baltimore made a lot of mistakes, Baltimore this, Baltimore that. I don't disagree, but I was referring to the fan base. And so I I don't, first of all, I don't give a shit about baseball organizations. This shit, they're (laughs) billion dollar industry. I don't care. These people are CEOs. Come on. I don't care. And if you've been listening to the podcast you would know that I am always going to go for who who is the person with less, who is the entity with less power in the dynamic that I'm talking about? That's who I'm always talking about. I am always siding with the entity or person or group of people that has less power in the dynamic, in the, in the dichotomy that I'm talking about. So when I said that the MLB and the MLB media was rude 
and uh, uh, cruel to Baltimore. I didn't mean the organization. I meant the fan base. This was their last time that they got to see him in an Orioles uniform, and it was an all-star uniform. And all they did was talk to him about leaving. I thought that was really unfair and really uncalled for. And if I was a Baltimore fan, I would be pissed. And you probably are. And you're justified. You are. It is not your fault. So that's what I just wanted to clear that up. Um, I think that the Machado trade is going to be good for the Dodgers. I do think it's a little short-sighted. But if they want to win a World Series, which they do... They need to be short-sighted right now, unfortunately. I mean, I think they gave away a lot of prospects that were looking pretty good. Um, But Corey Seager probably won't be playing until June of next year. Now, obviously Machado isn't necessarily going to stay in Los Angeles of next year, but what I'm saying is Corey Seager is definitely not playing this year. And Chris Taylor, as much as I like him and as much as his... uh, Swing has adjusted a little bit, it seems like, in the past couple days. Um, He is not a great shortstop. Now, I also feel like they could have absolutely made it work with Kike Hernandez at short, Chris Taylor in center, Max Muncy at second, uh, Justin Turner at third. But then again, that was me before Justin Turner had this extended groin issue. Justin Turner is dealing with a lot of injuries this year. He's pretty beat up. I think he played through some injuries last year, and now he's paying the price for that, which I would like to segue into something else, which is that I was watching MLB Now this morning, um, and they were talking about, that is a show I have not watched because I'm not usually home during the day these days, and uh, so I caught a little bit of that because I wanted to see what was going on, and they had uh, someone named Evan Davis, who is Evan Davis Sports on Twitter. Um, and they were talking about Jonas Cespedes and the, the recent news that he's in need of heel surgery, which takes something like 8 to 12 months to recover from. Now, all the other people on the panel were talking about, ooh, what's going on? It's weird that he's breaking the news and not the team, and ooh, do 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 all this stuff. Okay, Um And then they started showing video from the World Series a couple years ago. And then last season, I think, some plays where he didn't move um, on an inside-the-park home run, which I think was this year against Boston. And then some World Series stuff where he just could not track the ball down and missed the ball. Now, they started immediately shitting on him. And I, this guy, Evan Davis, who I then had a, a Twitter conversation with, said, you know, that looks like chronic pain to me. And you can't not uh, uh, talk about the fact that, like, this guy has chronic pain in a clubhouse that is known for tamping down injury. I mean, how many injuries are they dealing with right now? Plus, David Wright is basically going to have to retire. Like, I don't think that guy's ever going to play baseball again. Um, This is clearly a clubhouse that the culture of the clubhouse is play through the pain. And I just want to say thank you to Evan for continually... sticking up for a player who has played through some serious pain. So, so much pain that he requires surgery on both of his heels that requires eight to 12 months of recovery time. This is not a broken pinky. And even that, you shouldn't have to play through that. You you shouldn't have to. You should not have to play through this pain. It's not 1928. It's 2018. Yes, these guys are getting paid a lot of money. They get paid a lot of money because they put their bodies on the line to, to entertain people. And yes, they get the added benefit of playing a sport that they love. These guys are laborers. And if you cannot see that, then you're on the wrong side of history. And so I just want to say, I really appreciate Evan not backing down on that and continually sticking up for Jonas Cespedes and the fact that he was injured. An injury is not... And the, the a former player that was there was like, I'd never do that. Your catcher's standing there with your... Yeah, no, I know. I know. You shouldn't have to get beat up that bad to play baseball. You should be able to take time off to let your body heal to play baseball. It's ridiculous. So anyway, shout out to Evan. Just wanted to say that. Um, Also, on another tangent within my own tangent, I want to make a shout out to Kelly Wallace and Mary Craig, two people behind 
uh, the new website, Expanded Roster, which is a baseball-based website, um, or baseball-specific, I should say, um, with, you know, different perspectives that maybe might also align with some of my perspectives. So please give them a shout-out. Toss them a couple bucks if you've got it. They're trying to get something cool off the ground, and I appreciate that. The reason I also brought them up inside of this tangent, speaking of Evan Davis going on MLB Network and saying, no, I disagree with you, um, I just wanted to shout out them for their uh, Twitter activity and uh, refusal to back down from one Mr. John Heyman, who went on a serious trip of defending Josh Hader over the weekend. Um, And they came with receipts and screenshots, and it was very obvious that his reaction to, quote, female uh, baseball journalists, who he probably doesn't even believe that they're journalists, um, versus the men who were talking to them, who might not even be journalists, was very obvious. And uh, it was a great reminder as to why I make this podcast, because it's been great. I don't think I have, I'm not, you know, going to get the no- same numbers as Barstool, but to me, it's always quality, not quantity. I appreciate every single person that listens to this podcast because it makes me feel less alone and less like I'm wrong. And it's good to feel that way. And I hope everybody that listens to this podcast gets to feel a little bit like they're not wrong. So I wanted to shout out both of those folks and you should definitely follow them. And I can't wait to have both of them, either of them separately and together on the show. So all in all, uh, Machado went five for 13 with one RBI, one strikeout and two walks. So I think... I mean, look, he made a lot of great plays at shortstop. I think he's a great addition. Dodgers don't have a full-time shortstop. Now they do. So there you go. Now they just got to figure out the outfield. And trade Logan Forsyth. We need a pitcher. Phillies and A's. Bench coach Brett wanted me to flesh out my tweets on those two teams, but basically I just want to say I was right. (laughs) <laughs> the Phillies, I said they had all the pieces. Don't sleep on them. And then the A's, I said they've got the bats. They just need the arms. Well, guess what? They've got the arms now, and they are on a roll. They're having fun. That's a big part of it. They're having fun. Uh, the Red Sox have J.D. Martinez helping everybody with their swings. Uh, they're having fun. The Red Sox are having fun. Mookie Bez is having fun. Yes, the Cardinals have Matt Carpenter, who had a seven-game home run streak and then went five for five with three home runs and two doubles. But the Cardinals are not having fun. Matt Carpenter is hitting well. He's he's doing some uh, some wild stuff on the at the plate. Guess who had Matt Carpenter and dropped him? Me. I got real scared of that 190 average, and I shouldn't have because I knew he was making adjustments, but I dropped him for Max Muncy, I think. So, I mean, look. Max Muncy, I think, is going to keep hitting. Matt Carpenter's playing on a team that I don't think is going to get out of where they're at. What a week for the National League. We've got a ton of marquee series. We've got the Dodgers at Phillies. We've got the Diamondbacks at the Cubs, which always feels like, uh, I don't know, Back to the Future Part 2. It's like watching the Diamondbacks play in Wrigley is bizarre looking. Um, And then we've got Washington, or we've got the Nationals at the Brewers. I think that the Nationals versus Brewers is a wild one because both of these teams are on a bit of a skid um, trying to get their shit together. Max Scherzer was yelling at Steven uh, Steven Strasburg, and the Brewers are just not hitting. So I'm curious to see what goes on there. And we've got more trade, and we've got more trade deadline moves that don't involve Manny Machado. Washington Nationals traded a left fielder Brian Goodwin to the Kansas City Royals for right-handed pitcher Jacob Condra Bogan. Don't know about that one, but uh, they definitely need an arm. So if this guy can throw, sounds good to them. The New York Mets traded right-hand or right-handed pitcher reliever closer Jury's Familia to the Oakland Athle- Athletics for future considerations. Right-handed pitcher Bobby Wa- Walland and third baseman Will Toffee. Number one. A lot of the conversation about Familia is all of his stats. That guy served a uh, probation or whatever you call it for domestic violence. So I'm pretty disappointed in the A's for picking him up. 
They also already have Blake Trennan, who's having a wonderful career season. So it's pretty disappointing that they would pick him up. I'm bummed about it because I really like the A's. Um, and I mean, I still like them, but it's a bummer because it sucks uh, to pick somebody up like that. I also think the Mets do not know what they're doing, and their front office is very confused about how trades work because they took the first offer that got even remotely close to what they were looking for. And that is not good business. I'm not a huge fan of business in general. I think it's more finance that I don't like, but business, the first person to offer something is the first loser. That's how That's how it works. It's just how it works. So it was confusing to me that they were happy to do that. Um, moving on to the San Diego Padres trading left-handed uh, reliever closer Brad Hand and right-handed uh, pitcher Adam Simber to Cleveland for Francisco Meja. This one has two separate effects on me. Also, I just want to say this because it's a little look behind podcasting. When I was talking about something else, Josh Hader or something like that, I remembered something that I wanted to talk about. And guess what? I forgot. I'm going to start having a notepad in front of me so I can write down the things I'm thinking about when I think about them and I'm talking about something else. Ah, the life of a stand-up who does podcasting. So Brad Hand going to Cleveland is definitely good for Cleveland, given that Andrew Miller has had a difficult injury-ridden season. Also, Corey Kluber's back is giving out. This is why I did not target Corey Kluber, because I knew that around July or August, he was going to have back troubles. And then he's going to go on the shelf for a while because they're going to need to get him fresh for the postseason. So to me, he wasn't a good investment pitching-wise. Um, I did, however, make a dumb trade. Sorry, bad trade. Um, and I, I've talked about it a bunch, but I'm going to talk about it in more detail. My fantasy baseball league not only includes Brett, but it includes other comedians. And I traded with another comedian who is... Uh, a senior to my sophomore and or junior in terms of stand-up world. And I think because of that, I made a bad trade. I agreed to a bad trade, but I also was kind of ready to get rid of Tre Trevor Bauer because I can't stand him, but I knew he was going to have a good season. These are the complications of baseball and being progressive in baseball. And so I traded Trevor Bauer for Brad Hand. It was a bad trade and I knew it at the time. And then I thought maybe he'll be a trade target than he was, but not for a closer, for middle relief setup man, which in my fantasy league doesn't garner you anything. So I dropped him. I traded my best pitcher for somebody who's not even a closer anymore. Bad trade. This is my fantasy baseball advice for right now. I also made another, I think, bad trade, but hopefully Brian Dozier doesn't have a good second half. Hopefully he goes to the Brewers and it doesn't fix anything. Um... Make sure that if you're trading and or dropping, try to drop for what you're picking up or pick up what you just dropped. So my point is, if you drop a starting pitcher, pick up another starting pitcher. If you drop a reliever, pick up another reliever because it's the second half of the season and you can't get stuck without enough. So right now, if you drop utility, so somebody that has multiple eligibility then you better get somebody with multiple eligibility. Make sure you have those things in place. Lots of guys are going to be going on the DL. Lots of guys are going to be platooning for the postseason. So make sure that's what you're doing. There's one last trade. The Rangers traded right-handed pitcher Jesse Chavez to the Chicago Cubs for left-handed pitcher Tyler Thomas. Anything they can do to get Tyler Chetwood out of their rotation probably going to help their fan base not lose their shit every five days. So if that helps, great. <laughs> the slowest hit by pitch ever happened. Uh, Austin Barnes was hit by a 48 mile an hour slider gone wrong from Herman Perez. I've heard arguments that he shouldn't have been awarded the base because he didn't try to avoid the pitch, but it was such a strange pitch and it was pretty far behind him. I think it would have taken some serious contortions to get out of the way. What do you think? I agree, Brett. People don't understand uh, the the Charlie and Joe or whatever their names are that were doing the Dodger broadcast for this very game. 
they were talking about position players pitching and saying, oh, the fans are probably watching thinking these guys, how are these guys not getting hits off of them? Well, they explained it, and I also agree. These guys, hitting is timing. It's literally not anything else but timing, and pitching is interrupting that timing. I believe that's a Bob Gibson quote. Feel free to correct me. I apologize if I'm wrong. So if you take that to its logical conclusion, these guys are timing their hitting based on 80 to 103 mile an hour pitching with a median and an average in there of about 92 or whatever. Um, So they're timed to 90 miles an hour. Let's just say that. They are timed and ready for 97. 97 miles an hour is a pitch I just watched. So that's what they're used to. Most of us have no idea what 97 miles an hour actually looks and or feels like because we're not playing Major League Baseball. So now imagine that you're standing in the box and something is coming at you half the speed. It seems like, oh, that would be easier to get out of the way. Their eyes are trained to go, that is an 86-mile-an-hour slider. It's going to break this way. That's why he didn't move, (laughs) because he he didn't expect it to take that long, and he thought it was going to break, and it didn't, because it was 48 miles an hour. So you should get that base. I mean, you can't. You can't give a position player extra credit on the mound. I mean, come on. And that also explains why they're not getting hits and cranking home runs because you can't hit a ball hard that didn't come in hard or at least not in a game situation. You know what I mean? This reminds me of a time when I was playing in my baseball league and there was a guy who was a closer, which shouldn't have even existed in my old baseball league, and he could throw like 80 or something, and we had a, a rule uh, that nobody could pitch that hard, and they let him pitch anyways because whatever. Boys will be boys or some shit like that. And uh, he came in. He's pitching 85, something like that, very fast. I'm on deck, convincing myself, just get in there. Just... Who cares if you strike out? Just stay in there. You can do it. Get your head in there. Just stay in there. Take some swings. You can do it. I'm getting myself all psyched up, getting ready to get in there. I step into the box. I look up at him. I wait for the windup, and he just tosses the ball at me. And I got so mad, and he just kept tossing the ball at me. So I swung at one, and it was, I don't know, over my eyes, and I ground it out. And I was so furious, and I went to my catcher. I was like, that bullshit. And he was like, oh, just get a hit off of him, and walked away, (laughs) which is totally his speed. And he didn't mean anything by it other than, like, get a hit off of him. But I was so furious because I can't, you can't get a hit off of something like that. Not a good one. Because, again, it's messing with your timing. So that's why it was hard for these dudes to, you know, tee off because they're, getting something that's half middle speed or whatever. So anyway, got a few more things. The wild card teams, it is still early. Who do I think will nab the second AL wild card spot, assuming the AL East second place finisher nabs the first spot? Seattle, Oakland, late season surge by the Angels. I think it's between Seattle and Oakland for me. The Yankees are definitely going to get the first one. I'm curious to see how Seattle holds on. And then does Oakland ride this? And I think they have the opportunity to do it. People are showing up to their games. (laughs) I mean, I know that sounds simple and like not a lot, but people are showing up to their games. So, yeah, it could be real. And then about the NL wildcard, who are my picks? There are eight teams, yikes, with a legitimate shot at the NL wildcard spot. The Brewers, the Braves, the Diamondbacks, the Rockies, Pirates, Cardinals, Giants, and Nationals. Out of all of those, I feel like the best shot is the Diamondbacks, the Braves, and the Pirates. That's my top three, and I don't think I can get them closer to that. That's that's those are my picks. Out of that, there's gonna be there's gonna be one. So we'll see. Let's see if I'm right. If it's one of those three, and if we get when we get closer, I'll start narrowing it down more. 
I've been talking for 45 minutes because there is no ad. So um, maybe just come to my shows. And I wanted to answer a rosin bag that I started last week but didn't get a chance to finish, which was what were my favorite baseball games of all time or what was my favorite baseball video game of all time. And uh, number one, I have to say the show definitely wins. It's the best baseball game of all time. But I wanted to take a trip down memory lane and tell you about uh, my favorite baseball games in order of appearance. And if your game doesn't show up, that means I didn't play it. That means somebody I knew didn't own it. And I didn't own it. So my first baseball game that I ever played was Little League World Series for Nintendo. Highlights of that are me having a temper about it, my mom being mad that I had a temper about it, and me saying, well, why don't you play it? And then she did and had a temper about it. So that was a nice moment of childhood. Uh, Then RBI Baseball. That was one of my favorites. I played as uh, Atlanta. And I just realized that I said Braves earlier, and I'm not supposed to do that because I care about people. And so I'm retroactively apologizing for that and referring to them as Atlanta. I apologize. And RBI Baseball was one of those uh, games that didn't really have logos or uniforms. So that was a great intro to that. Then the game that I remember the most is ESPN Baseball Tonight. I used to play that on my screened-in porch at night with my friend, my best friend. We would play that thing over and over again and hear, gone, and the whiff over and over again. If I could make that my life ringtone, I would. Those are my favorite baseball games. I kind of stopped playing them after that. I never played Ken Griffey. I don't know why. I got super into Goldeneye, and I was really into Wayne Gretzky's Hockey 98. I got really into it. You could fight in that game. It was a lot of fun. I don't know why. I stopped playing baseball games. So So those are my top baseball video games. There's two more questions. Three more questions that I want to answer. Uh, There's Nels Kristen. I was a Brewers fan, but after today, I don't think I can be a part of that fan base. Is it possible to separate the fans from the team, or is it all the same? How did you come to terms moving on from the Cleveland BB team? That's a great question. It's real hard to do. And I know it seems silly and frivolous for a lot of people, but you love your team, and you grew up with it, and... You had a family connection around this team or friendship connection or a favorite player and you've got jerseys and it reminds you of your childhood and it reminds you of all these things. And I understand it's hard and it's sad and it's difficult, but you just have to make a choice and a decision that you don't want to support that thing. And you might not be able to do it. And that's okay because you're a human being. Just make sure you're actively fighting and openly fighting against these things and speaking out against them when it happens in a way that doesn't put you in actual physical danger as much as possible. Um, The Cleveland baseball team will always hold a place in my heart and I will probably never fully ever let go of that stupid team because I grew up with them and uh, I have fond memories of players and games and moments, but I just got to a place where I couldn't do it anymore. It was so conflicting, and I I also don't live there, so it's not... I mean, I still see people with a block C, and I want to be like, go Cleveland, but I just don't. I mean, honestly, LeBron leaving was a big part of me feeling, like, free, that I don't have to participate in this thing that I feel is wrong. So... I was able to move on and the Dodgers have bad things in their history and they're a luxury franchise and I'll always have a place in my heart for, you know, small market, small ball, just like Milwaukee. But there comes a point when you're like, I'm not sure that this is important anymore. And like, yeah, I mean, you can watch the games and you can follow them and not externally support them for sure. It's totally doable. I did that for a long time and then I realized like, oh, I just don't, don't need to do this at all. I can actually just like this team that's down the street from me. Um, So I was lucky in that way that I had that opportunity. So I wish you a lot of luck. It's a, it's a tough decision to get to. Uh, Moving to Jack Stensrud. I've been a Mariners fan all my life and I'm not sure 
that I was prepared for them to actually be good this year. Even now, I'm still terrified about their recent decline. Do you have any recommendations for being comfortable in a team's success? I mean, look, that's been the story of my life in terms of success. There's you're never going to feel comfortable. But look, we get the benefit of that. We're not Yankee fans. We, we don't get to go, well, we've got 27 rings, so who gives a shit? And then walk away when they lose. We go, no, this was the year. And it's never going to happen again. But that's why we love this, right? Because we get to feel that. And it makes you, I don't know, it just makes you more open to things not going right and trying to make them better. That's the way I try to look at it. And try to enjoy the ride. I had friends last year that were like, I don't want to get too invested in the Dodgers. I love them, but I don't want to get my heart broken. Well, that's baseball. That is baseball. I got fully invested in that team. They're like my team now. They're my team now. And who knows? I don't know if I'm a Dodger fan for life. I like this team. But I'm invested. And if they lose, they lose. And I will lose. And I will feel sad about it. And that's what happens. That's the game. So I hear you. I guess the other thing you can know is like other fans feel the same way. And so you're not alone. So good luck, my friend. And then my last question is from my name's Moses. What outfielder do you want Cleveland to target? I know he's not what he was defensively, but is Adam Jones our best option? Um, probably. But I, I'm curious if Adam Jones puts on a Cleveland uniform, just because I know he's very outspoken against about... Uh, injustice in baseball so i'm curious as to whether he would actually do that um and so i'd love to see that play out and how that would go but i'd also like to see adam jones on a team in contention um and it's unfortunate that cleveland would probably be that team but um i think he's a great dude i think he could get back into a groove so that's how i feel about that very curious to see so this has been another episode. I just talked for an hour uh, while watching this game, and uh, it's been an interesting one. I'm excited to be in Dublin. Please check out the Baseball for All uh, website and their socials. Give them a follow. Give their kids a follow. Support those kids. They're out there doing what they love, and they're getting a chance to do it. Justine is supporting the dream, the dream of playing baseball, and we just need the opportunity. So give them a follow. If you have some extra cash you could donate, do that. I'm sure they would appreciate it. They're a very small organization just trying to give kids some fun. Thanks again for listening. Uh, please give us a, a review, rate, subscribe on iTunes. That helps us out a lot. I wanted to give a shout out to the AV Club for the awesome uh, Podmas write-up. I think I neglected to do that last week, and I apologize. Thank you so much. I really appreciated it. It was super kind and great and made me feel good, which is a nice thing. Um, and then follow us, follow Forever Dog Podcast Network uh, on socials. Follow me, Rhea Butcher, on my socials. Get in on my Instagram. I just posted some uh, fall tour dates. I'm going to be in Boise, Idaho, Portland, Oregon, uh, Seattle, Washington. Um, and then I'm going to be at the Benson Ball this year. So check those out on my website. Get some tickets for that. I'm doing a weekend in September, this weekend of September 13th in Burlington, Vermont at their new comedy club. Um, so give that a look. Check that out. And uh, thank you so much for listening. I'm really enjoying doing this podcast. I can't wait to get some guests back on here and can't wait to just keep talking at you from my living room. So as always, if you liked it, you liked it. Forever. Dog. This has been a Forever Dog production. Executive produced by Brett Boehm, Joe Cilio, and Alex Ramsey. For more original podcasts, please visit foreverdogpodcasts.com and subscribe to our shows on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Keep up with the latest Forever Dog news by following us on Twitter and Instagram at Forever Dog Team, 